Let's go, Lo Fi Poli Sci. Coming at you, Michael Pickering here with our good friend Gregory Day, a writer, director, bookseller, and the voice behind Hipsville AD, the fanatical sect of God of subcultures and fervent rampants of a whole breed of cinematic pleasures. How are we doing out there today, Gregory Day? Oh, man, I am great. I'm excited to be back here. It's been a while since we've done this. I know, right? It, the summertime gets crazy. Everyone's like, oh, nice, summertime, we'll relax. But man, we just get busier and busier. Yeah, I'm, glad that's to, true. I'm glad to be talking movies again with you for sure. And, and, and yeah, what, what kind of movie top 10 list are you bringing to the people today? Yeah, it's summertime. So I felt like it'd be a great time to talk about uh, Hollywood classics. You know, I, uh, I, I, I say some disparaging things about American cinema from time to time on this show. From so I wanted time to, to time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I wanted to come on the show and present the top 10 classics. Uh, and uh, I kind of need to set that up uh, for you here before we get going. But uh, yeah, it's like the perfect thing to do during summers is to, is to, you know, go, go to a movie uh, screenings of some old stuff and, and just sit back, relax and take in all that uh nostalgia that these uh, movies offer and so yeah i feel like it was about time we talked about them i like it i like it and and set up your your parameters for what you consider a hollywood classic yeah so uh the films that we're going to be talking about are from the classic studio system and so this is between the 30s and the 60s this is when the studio system was at the height of its power uh and the studios were mgm warner brothers paramount fox RKO, and then we also had in smaller versions of uh, Universal, Columbia, and United Artists. And so uh, it was a whole system where they had directors and stars under contracts, and they churned out movies uh, like a conveyor belt where it was uh, entertainment first. But uh, they also did, um, you know, touch on some social issues and, and realities of the day. But uh, ultimately, the system was flawed in, in many ways, one, because it was a monopoly over many different things. They distributed their films, they had theaters, and they controlled the press around their movies. And so the government had to break them up. And ultimately, by the 60s, like the way the world was changing, the, the films coming out of Europe and Japan were much more for uh, adult audiences and the, and the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War. Really, all these things kind of really contributed to the system kind of collapsing before we get to the the 70s when we have a, a different kind of American cinema coming out. And so all the films we're going to talk about today are really from the classic period uh, from the 30s to the 60s. I dig it because we've talked a lot about exploitation films and genre films. I mean, that's your bag at Hips for Lady, right? So like yeah, yeah. the 1970s and 80s, especially you've have featured prominently in a lot of your list, but now mm -hmm. now we're going back to like you know not genre films. In fact, the opposite of genre, right? <laughs> uh, not necessarily, but we can get into that as we talk about each of these picks. But uh, yeah, these are the films that really uh, you know kind of represent what the studio system was making, and and they really represent like the, what the times uh, they were made in. Excellent, excellent. Well, with that, let's let's just jump right into it, my friend. What do you got for number ten? Yes, yeah, so number 10 is we're starting with Scarface from 1932, which is very much a genre movie, but it's sort of one of the first genres that the Hollywood studio system really latched on to. And this was a reaction to the violence brought about by Prohibition. Um, and so Warner Brothers was a studio known for making gangster films. They made quite a few of them. Um, I think we talked about Public Enemy on this uh, podcast. Yeah, before. we have. Uh, yeah, which was probably... I think was the first one they made um, and sort of kicked it off. But Scarface is, you know, it's a really famous film uh, directed by Howard Hawks and stars Paul Mooney and made him a star at the time. It's based on the life of Al Capone. It features very many uh, beats in the plot that reference uh, stuff that happened in Chicago around Al Capone, especially the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Uh, but this is like a great um, launching of like Tommy gun toting, wisecracking, uh, gangsters, but it's also the story of immigration and um, does uh, America at the time, well, I mean, it did, but it's uh, sort of brought up in the movie about the fear of immigrants, especially the Italian immigrants, um, you know, and how much does an immigrant have to do to make a living in this country? And so, um, yeah, it's just this big bombastic gangster film. And of course, it was remade in the 80s with uh, Al Pacino. And yeah, this is a great way. This great introduction again to it it's very fast. It's very zippy. Um, and it's just got a lot of great style to it. So um, yeah, great place to start with uh, Hollywood filmmaking is with a gangster picture. And you know, I heard 
that I want to say they're remaking it again, starring think Diego so. Luna. So like 90 years in the making, right? Like the yeah. Scarface was first came out in 1932. Like that's an old ass film. And I, I know of this film. Like I knew all about Al Capone and how it really focuses on him, but it just doesn't name him. And mm-hmm. like you referenced the St. Valentine's Day Massacre and like, Definitely, I think almost everyone, even if you haven't seen it, you know of the Al, Al Pacino Scarface movie. You know, like it's it's so huge. Even in pop culture, Zeitgeist, like still today, people still talk about it. You know, you see posters of it all kinds of places. But I've actually never seen this movie. It's like I've I know so much about it, but I've I've yeah. never seen it. I know I know, like I said, it's really about Al Capone. But one thing I, I liked. Or that caught me and the trailer, like the trailer towards the end of it is showing like how how just in the remake, it looks like Scarface is about to go out in the blaze of glory, like, you know, in a major shootout with the cops mm-hmm. or whatever. And, you know, Al Capone was still like around at this time. So it it, it kind of to me was like the filmmaker was like, oh, yeah, if Al Capone's going to go out, he's going to go out like this. <laughs> And we we both know how Al Capone went out. He did not go out in a blaze of glory at all. I yeah. mean, that dude ended up in Alcatraz, which I think most people do know. But here's a little quiz for you. Do you know, you know, did he die in Alcatraz? Yes or no? No. Okay, where did he die and how long after and of what? Do you know all that? Uh, I don't know how long he died afterwards. I know he died of uh, complications due to his syphilis. Uh, but I'm pretty sure he died in Florida, like in a family That's home right. or summer home or something <laughs> like that. But I don't know how many years after he his release. But yeah, he died of you know, um, of bad, um, you know, complications because of syphilis. Like I know he he lost a lot of his brain uh, capacity and you know, all that stuff because of it. Yeah, you know, if people talk about you know karma as a bitch in life, I think that dude did some horrible <laughs> stuff, and thus he died yes, via he syphilis. Did. You know, yes, like yes, yes. oh, yeah. But I would say that this film. Um, around I don't think the Hays Code. Uh, do you need? Do you know what the Hays Code is? Should I? Should I, I don't. Explain yeah, that? I don't know what. That yeah. Is. So like, when the Hollywood system started, there was no real censorship or real guidelines as to what subject matter or whatever they could do in films. And so there's a lot of uh, what's called pre-code films, um, which depicted uh, violence and sex, and it had some some foul language in them, and they. Um, didn't necessarily always have the a moral compass to make sure that the good guy always wins and things like that. But um, there was a conservative backlash in this country that pr- uh, prompted the studio systems to create its own system to police the content of the films. And so to be in line with that, uh, it was called the Hays Code. And to be in line with that, they had to make sure um, if your main character was uh, morally corrupt, they paid for it in the end. Um, you know, uh, non-married individuals could not kiss or sleep together on screen, and so a lot of these things, uh, yeah. So a lot of these things were in put in the '30s to make sure films didn't um do the you know depict these certain things, and so um, Scarface at the end of this film had to Tony has to die, uh, for all the things that he does, he has to die. Um, and so no kidding, yeah. So that's the way the film is really structured. But I can't say for certain if this film was before the code or not. But this is around the time the code really comes in. Um, but the code then creates a lot of ways for filmmakers and studios to metaphorically uh, do things like closing a door when two people, you know, a man and a woman walk in a room and they close the door and then it, you know, fades to black. That's you know, signaling to the audience that they're going to sleep together or things like that. Um, where they had to start to talk about these, you know, certain things they wanted to depict in specific ways, um, which we may get into later in this list. But um, yeah, for him to go out like this, it's, it was almost like mandated that uh, a, a character like this had to die in the end. That's so crazy. I never know all that, but it, it it doesn't surprise me because Hollywood is pretty kooky, and U.S. <laughs> government has done some kooky things too. Huh? Huh? Yeah, but let's move on to your number nine. I I I really want to talk about this one. What you got for us? Yeah, this is the Gold Diggers of nineteen thirty three. Um, you know, this is another genre film because uh, one of the things the Hollywood studio system really excelled at was making musicals. Uh, musicals was not really. There are musicals in other countries, but they weren't as prevalent as the ones the uh, studio system kicked out. Um, MGM was really famous for their musicals, but this is a Warner Brothers one. And what uh, is special about this one, and there's several others that are very similar to this, uh, is that they're choreographed by Bugsy, uh, Busby Berkeley, um, who is 
a dance choreographer who really took the musical away from the stage musical and started to use the tools of cinema to do different things with uh, choreographed dance, a uh, song and dance. And so uh, he would take the camera on a crane and, and, you know, shoot it overhead. And so you have all these people dancing, but they're choreographed in a way to we're making geo, you know, uh, geometrical shapes or they're um, in weird avant-garde designs. And so just kind of really playing around with like how to use uh, action uh, or movement, I should say, movement and song and dance and the camera and all that to do really um, weird and exciting things with it. But uh, being a Warner Brothers film, this is a movie that is addressing social uh, realism at times, just like they were doing with their gangster films. This is a movie uh, that's directly addressing the depression. It's about um, these coarse girls who are really worried that the depression um, is going to wipe out their jobs and they don't know what they're going to do because the theater is really suffering. And so uh, while, while it's a musical, it's really tackling, you know, what's happening out there. And um, this is one of the game changing, uh, you know, movies of its time because it really elevated uh, or, or uh, distinguished, I should say, um, the movie musical from the stage musical. And so I have to admit, I, I have not seen this one, but I would, I just like to start off by saying, I never, ever, ever, ever would have guessed that the phrase gold digger was such an old phrase, like an old <laughs> saying. And like yeah. you see it in in the trailer, like um, the actress is like doing gold digging. And it's like, damn, this is like 90 years ago. I, and it makes me wonder mm -hmm. how old is this saying? And it also makes me think about the language we use. Like, so the the more contemporary song, I can't even think about who sings that song, gold digger, but... um. Kanye West? Yeah, that sounds about yeah. right. Um, <laughs> like, we're still using language today that mm -hmm. was being used over 100 years ago. And, like, Hollywood and movies are, are, like, good for that, right? Catching or making catchphrases and things like this. And it also, in a way, symbolizes that we're still doing some of the same things that we were doing 100 years ago. And, you know, we've had our own global recession not too, too long ago. And it's, it's like do we really like make new history or are we just repeating ourselves? And, and yeah. that's kind of like a, a theme I felt with a lot of this. Like I look back at some of these pictures of like almost a hundred years ago and I'm like, wow, things are so different, but, but are they so different? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I guess the term gold digger in some ways could probably go back to all the different, uh, or, you know, the time of the gold rushes in the late 1800s where, um, you know, these guys probably went from place to place looking for gold and that was, you know, exploiting um, the different places. And that's all they did, you know. Um, wow, that would make sense. Yeah. Obviously, it's recontextualized. Um, but I guess in, in some ways, it's very similar, you know, kind of the exploitative nature of being a gold digger. Dude, and I love this trailer because, it, like, I love the, the choreographed dancing. I love the different shots that they were using. And to think that this was in 1933, like, some of the filming techniques I was extremely impressed with. And I was like, dude, this looks like a good movie that has some heart to it. And that's telling just, like, a real life story about perspective. And for Hollywood to be doing that, but in the middle of the Great Depression, I think that's pretty innovative. I like yeah, it. I'm I'm yeah. very much leaning towards watching this one, my friend, very <laughs> yeah. much. Although we still have another one we have to watch. I'm going to throw it out there. I still want to watch say the... I also uh, just to throw a shout out because it's another film that Busby Berkeley... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's it? What the the choreographer did this one and the last one? Oh no no no! I'm sorry. I was gonna say that uh, he also did a film called Forty Second Street, which is about uh, you know the guys not coming back from the First World War. And so that's a uh, it's also a really great uh, social film, but also uh, another wild musical like this. So I just gotta throw a shout out uh, to that film because it's oh super gotcha good. gotcha. Well, I'll tell you, maybe we'll watch this one, but we got to watch um, <laughs> the the good, the bad, and the weird first. Yes, 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 yes. All right, so what do you got coming up for number eight now? Where are we going? Yeah, number eight, we're staying in the 1930s, but we're going towards uh, one of the biggest staples of American filmmaking ever. It's the Western. And there was one single film that really kicked off the Western feature film craze, and that's Stagecoach from 1939. Uh, there were many serialized Westerns before this, but this is really... Um, a turning point in Western filmmaking because it's out in Monument Valley and it's got a lot of great photography, but it's from director John Ford who introduces the world to his new star, John Wayne, in this film. And it's just, um, you know, it's a star-making movie for him when he was young and 
and strapping. Um, but the, this film, I think, still really holds up well because it's like a uh, it's an ensemble piece about this sort of misfit ragtag group of people in this stagecoach traveling through dangerous territory. Um, and it's got some dodgy politics about the um, indigenous characters in the film. But the reason it's memorable is because of how great the script is. And it's got one of the all time um, mind blowing stunts in this film for the 1930s. It's got a stunt man. And they're going full force on this stagecoach, and it's got three different sets of horses pulling this coach, and it's going out of control. And the stuntman jumps from horse to horse to horse to get to the front, all in one take. Damn. Um, and wrangles the horses. And it's supposed to be John Wayne's character, but it's clearly um, a stuntman who, <laughs> who did this. But it's it's still to this day. I mean, this is uh, you know ninety years ago, eighty years ago. It has just it's so incredible to watch this, and it's like being filmed on a truck so the truck is getting closer and closer to the to the stagecoach as you're watching this guy do this these jumps and so it's just still great it's just great filmmaking all the way around and um yeah it's very it's just very satisfying because the characters come through really well and it's a great action movie it's funny to me to think that at one point in time a stagecoach with six horses pulling it was like the fastest way to get from point a to point b <laughs> yeah and and jumping from from horse to horse like that that seems like oh yeah you could do that man I would never in my life try to that like that's hardcore stuff jumping from horses to horses while moving um, yeah I have heard of this movie like a lot and I've seen parts of it I don't think I've ever seen it in its entirety because my mom was a huge John Wayne fan so I grew up mm -hmm. watching a lot mm -hmm. of different John Wayne but she was more like a McClintock person than oh, okay yeah a stagecoach person mm -hmm. but i this this movie is well known to me and as one of john wayne's early works and then he goes on from this one in 1939 to just have a massive career and such an influence in american cinema for the next couple decades really yeah oh, and i didn't realize this 39 was like his breakout role i would have always thought it he was before that um so that also kind of makes me wonder like when did his career end and i don't know that uh because um, he was such a staple yeah, yeah i don't i can't remember when he actually died but i think he he probably i think he died in the 70s because uh, he was a very outspoken person about the vietnam war um in support of the vietnam war and so he was uh, sort why of, is that uh, not surprising uh, uh, <laughs> yeah so at that point in his life in his career he was very much a uh, proponent of the right wing justification to stay in the war um uh, i don't know if he didn't make a lot of movies at that time but yeah he was uh, he was around for decades Interesting, interesting. But no, like I said, this this movie Stagecoach is really well known to me. So I'm not yeah. surprised that it came up when your top ten for for Hollywood classics. Um, and then saying that you're number seven, I'm also not surprised with, and I cannot wait to talk about this one because I think it's something we all know about, but we oh, don't yeah. necessarily talk about. So bring us to your number seven. Yeah, number seven is uh, we you know we can't talk about any of the this era without talking about charlie chaplin and so i picked the best one to represent him and my personal favorite city lights uh, from 1931 uh, i mean in some you know arguably chaplin is the greatest cin cinematic entertainer to ever live uh but he was a great not only a great actor but he wrote his films he directed them um and he did all of his stunts in them and came up with all the gags in them and so he uh was all around um uh, entertainer but uh you know, if you know anything about Chaplin, he's also very uh, aware of poverty, and all of his films deal with poverty. He was he was from uh, extreme poverty. He grew up in, in England in, in extreme poverty, but when he made it in uh, famous in in movies, it was always his. Uh, he always used his, his tramp character um, to explore not only like, uh, humorous gags, but um, object poverty, like his films, uh, The Kid and Gold Rush. Uh, but everything, this is his, everything kind of culminates with this film because this is his last true blue silent movie, even though there are some elements of sound in it um, that takes him on through these misadventures through high society and, pardon me, and, um, you know, into the boxing ring and just these really great gags. But underlying all this is is a really heartwarming romance with a blind woman who can't see that he isn't uh, a wealthy person. He is a... a you know, for lack of a better term, a per person experiencing homelessness, which is not how they uh, referred to them back then. You know, he was very much considered a tramp and a person who lived on the street and, and undesirable. And so um, it's got a lot of heart to this film, even though it's got all these um, these wacky um, 
incidents in them. And Chaplin was just so great at making people laugh, but also making them aware of the struggles that people went through. And so this, you know, no better movie that he sort of talked about this stuff than in City Lights. Yeah, I've seen a lot of clips of Charlie Chaplin. I don't know if I've ever seen any of his work full front to beginning. So I've mm -hmm. seen clips of City Lights and I know of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really think I I, I really want to see a biopic of him because mm -hmm. I would be I'm so interested about him as a person and a character uh, in film to be like, how big was he in his day and age? And what was that like for him? Like, like this film yeah. came out in 1931. He was known mm -hmm. as the silent actor, you know, and I'm just curious about how big he was in his time, really. Like, who would would we yeah. compare him to like? I don't know, Tom Cruise today or like Denzel Washington today or like anyone like really, uh, really big, you know, maybe you can tell me. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I would say that we cannot compare those guys with Chaplin at all because Chaplin was like the Beatles big. Uh, he was just like, um, I'll have to send you some photos, but like city streets packed with people big to come see him when he would do press for his films or like he would be outside um giving speeches or whatever because he was very political active politically active um but like i don't think there's a star that exists today um that compares with how huge chaplin was really um, damn yeah, this is like this is like pictures where it's like you would think it's a political rally or a march going on in the streets of how many people would show up to see him um in certain in, you know certain times he would come out and speak or do, or do uh press but um yeah, there is a biopic. I don't remember it very well. I saw it when I was probably a kid, but it's called Chaplin. The Robert Downey Jr. played him in a film. Really? Uh, yeah, but from the in the nineties. But I can't really speak to it now because I don't really remember much of it. But um, yeah, it was this film after this, Modern Times, where he started to really introduce his socialist views into his films, and that's when Hollywood really didn't like him anymore. After that, um, and, and so, that's when they went yeah. to John Wayne. <laughs> yes well he made he made modern times and then he made the great dictator which also are really great great movies um because he was talking about social problems and then he was got to talk about what's happening in europe with the war and 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 hitler and then uh, really after that um is when he wasn't welcome back anymore because the war was over and communism socialism were the enemy and he had to leave i'm pretty sure he got deported um, Damn. he had to go back to england and he made the rest of his films in england um for the rest of his life and so yeah this is the end of the heyday i mean his other films are very good um but this is really the end of the heyday of like um before chaplin really kind of um you know pushes boundaries with the, with the authorities that's crazy i never realized he was that huge of a movie mm -hmm. star he wasn't just a movie star he was the no. movie star yes he was yeah yeah i love it i love it i love it well where are we going with your number six yeah. pick Number six is, is a film that's very near and dear to me. I fucking love this movie. Um, but it's a sort of a different kind of film that touches on a lot of the different uh, strengths of Hollywood filmmaking, specifically uh, offering thrills and romance. And so uh, one of the greatest films to ever do that is Shanghai Express from 1932. Uh, it's a film centered around the star power of Marlene Dietrich. Um, set in China on a train traveling across the country that's taken over by revolutionaries and very similar to um, Stagecoach it's got a um, it's got an ensemble cast and, and a lot of the strengths of the film is how these characters interact with each other um, so a lot of the hostages are from different international backgrounds and it's sort of a, a flavors of different European cultures and Americans and and um, some Chinese characters and how they interact but it's also it's also a little snapshot into the world to see how many of, uh, you know, to see the Western attitudes towards um, Asia at the time. Because, you know, the, in the 30s, Asia is in complete upheaval um, in war, just like uh, that's about to happen in Europe. And so this film is like an espionage thriller where the uh, Marlene Dietrich character befriends a Chinese woman on the, on the train and then they get captured by revolutionaries and everyone is trying to um, figure out how to get off the train and get out of being kidnapped Um by these dangerous men uh but the film is that's like what it is on the surface but the film really beneath it is so all about lost time and how a lot of these characters have pasts that intermingle with each other and whether uh they're ever going to get back the time they lost um the romantic feelings they lost for each other do they have enough time to get out of the situation they're in what, what would they do differently 
Um, and yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's like a regretful film in many ways, but uh, it's such a fantastic movie that just hits all the great points of like what Hollywood filmmaking is at the time. Like it's the lighting and it's set design and it's real, the star power around Marlene Dietrich. And so, yeah, this is a, this is a movie I would highly recommend today because it's just, it's still captivating and it, it doesn't feel like anything that's being made today. And so this is a great snapshot of, you know, classic thirties filmmaking. Shanghai Express is one I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen, if not seen the whole thing, I've seen a lot of it. This is really well known to me. This is like you said, this oh. is, an incredibly famous movie and mm -hmm. growing up i was very aware of this as well and it also it kind of makes me think like i haven't thought about this film in quite some time but partially because the name and partially because it takes place on a train it does mm -hmm. also make me think of another movie about an express and that's murder on the orient express oh yeah mm -hmm. and and i kind of wondered was agatha christie like, did these things happen adjacent of each other or did they influence one or the other in a direction? I don't know. Um, but yeah, it just made know. me think yeah. of that because Agatha mm -hmm. Christie was early 1900s as well, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. But I don't know when her book came out versus when this writing came out for this uh, film. But I love this topic because while Murder on the Orient Express is more about just like the surrounding of one murder on a train and a whole bunch of different people from a whole bunch of different places, this one is is minus the murder but it's about all the connections of people but in a place in the world and it's talking about the politics of the world of the day and mm -hmm. i could only imagine that an american audience had no idea what was going on in the 1930s in asia in shanghai and in, in any of that area um, mm -hmm. and then you have a movie that that brings it all up i think you know this is incredible i think this is likely one of the only ways that you know, American public get to know more about the world that we actually exist in post World War One, but before World War Two. Yeah, I mean, so I think this is an incredible piece. Yeah, I mean, I think that there is uh, a lot to be said about the. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of like the film reels they would show before the news reels before the movies at the time, and so they would be like, uh, you know, reels of films that were showing like what was happening in Germany at the time, and so you would see the Nazi footage or when they invaded Poland or things like that, and they would show these reels before movies, and so it was the precursor to um, news on t television, and so they did get a lot of that sort of news, but um, yeah, it's probably very limited and definitely not nuanced uh, in any way. Um, but I had right, to and say, I wonder yeah. how early. So this was in '32. I mean, this yeah. is still seven years before Hitler invades yeah. Poland. Like, I'm wondering, yeah. and I don't know the answer to this. And if mm -hmm. you don't, that's fine. But I'm just curious. Like, when did those newsreels before films start? You know, Ooh, I, I like. Good. Yeah. I know they happened. I just I don't mm -hmm. know when they really yeah. started. Yeah, yeah. I don't know either, but definitely has to happen. Probably happen um, around 1930 or so because. I, uh, uh, sound comes in in 1928 uh so it doesn't become prevalent until after that till 29 where it becomes starts to really take over as as uh the standard and so um probably not until 1930 or so around this time we're probably where the newsreel was coming in um because they had the ability to to narrate um you know real uh news footage for the first time Ooh, I love it. I love it. It's crazy to me to think about the transition of news, <laughs> but also news yeah. and, and film. And I, I think a lot of what I conceptualize, and I think many people conceptualize about like the classic Hollywood period of 30s and 60s, it was all fantasy stuff, you know, just thinking about mm. the good life. Yeah. But like this one is a great example, Shanghai Express, about what's going down yeah. right before Japan starts invading everywhere um, during mm. the Chinese Civil War. You know, it's like the communists are coming to power. The um, democratic people are inevitably going to be going to Taiwan, but they're still in China right now fighting. Like, this is a crazy cool period to look into. I would be interested yeah. in watching this one again to see how much more I catch versus whenever I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. it's great. And I have to, uh, before we move on, um, also throw uh, a mention in about Anna Mae Wong, who was the first Asian star of Hollywood cinema, who was the secondary uh, lead in this film to Marlene Dietrich. She's amazing. And, um, you know, she kind of steals the show for all of those scenes she's in in this film. Yeah, I saw her in a couple scenes, but I didn't know. <clears throat> excuse me, I noticed her in a couple scenes, but I didn't notice her feature prominently as as the main lead. Which, considering the times, I wasn't surprised. Yeah, that's cool to know that that was still second lead. Yeah. 
All right, well, now we're jumping into our top five. And, and where are you coming in with number five? Yeah, number five. I definitely wanted to talk about the film noir movement because it was the movement that um, came out of World War II in, Amer in American cinema. It was the movies that were focusing more on um, existentialism and paranoia and dread um, coming out of the war and into the Cold War. Um, but instead of doing spotlighting one that's about you know crooks and cops and and uh, weird plots and stuff, I wanted to talk about the sweet smell of success from 1957 because it takes all of the noir style and and type of you know um, you know on screen styles and the way that those films are made and applies it to our uh, media here in America and a propaganda machine. And it's about this uh, this New York. Uh, media mogul who can basically control the narrative about everything in New York uh, with the exception of, of his little sister who is rebelling against him. And so he has this, uh, this lackey named Sydney who is trying to do everything he can to, um, you know, sort of follow in this mogul's footsteps, but, uh, and so he's trying to insert himself into his, the sister's life and control her life. And when, um, aside by this mogul, but he really finds that um, everything about this life is toxic and is going to chew up everybody and spit them out. Um, it's just a nasty world, uh, this New York um, media world. And so um, it's still in, incredibly relevant today. I mean, I don't think you get to a show like Succession that just ended without looking at a movie like this about just how terrible um, and cannibalistic American newspapers and uh, especially um, the entertainment rags can really be how they make and, and break stars and politicians and all these things and so this this movie tackles all that stuff and we're still seeing all that today so i have to admit this is another one i haven't seen but mm -hmm. this one i haven't even heard of oh wow but i will say i love the trailer and and people <laughs> in the 50s it was so yeah. like there was this one quote it was like I'd hate to take a bite out of you. You're a cookie full of arsenic. And it's like, it's like, I imagine in the 1950s, that was quite a, a thing. But now I'd yeah. be like, most people are like, what the fuck is arsenic? Like, what are you trying to say? Like, oh, like sure. yeah. it's poison, right? So like, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that, I was just like listening to it and watching it. I was like, this is such a great snapshot of, once again, like culture, but like you were saying, like business mm -hmm. culture. And, yeah. and the way people talk and spoke and interacted with each other in the 1950s. And let me just say, I'm glad I didn't exist in the 1950s. Fuck that. <laughs> like, some, you're full of arsenic. Take a bite out of you cooking. Like, yeah, I was yeah. just like, ah. <laughs> but it, yeah. it did make me think, like, mm. you know, again, with language, like, how much of it has survived and how much of it not. And mm -hmm. also makes me think of, like, all of the, the the different catchphrases we use today and how we speak today. Like, how much of that will actually survive? Like, I've never heard someone say, ooh, you're a cookie full of arsenic, you know? Like, that <laughs> obviously did not survive. Um, right, but there's right. there's another pick mm -hmm. that maybe some things have survived that I want to talk about this conversation a little more with. Sure. Um, no, I, I, liked, I liked what this seemed to be about because I also got the feel of, like, you know, he was a gossip columnist. I also got the feel of, like, oh, fake news is so relevant today. Like, Oh, sure. And that's what gossip was. And so mm -hmm. I feel like watching this in the context of today's world – especially with like AI and chat GBT, you know, mm -hmm. pumping out like fake information. Like this, this could be an interesting rewatch today in 2023. Oh yeah. It's uh it still holds up like, um, but to talk about its uh, style of language and everything, I think there's like a, all, all of the films on this list really, um, you know, part of Hollywood filmmaking is they don't exist in our reality. These are films, the style of, of speaking is, uh, not really supposed to reflect um, how we really talk. It's all in service of the themes and um, the world that it's creating. And so a lot of these films are written with such great style that, that you could say certain things like that. And in the context of the movie, it makes total it makes total sense that people would speak like this. But in reality, if you said if you told that to somebody, it'd be like Ben, what you had to really reach for that metaphor, um, <laughs> you know. But like it's it just really works in the in the it's I guess it comes from the world of like sage uh, you know of sage plays where um, in, the, in Shakespeare and the great dialogue uh, driving everything. And so um, yeah, so it's just you know just really great. Um, fantasy to everything and that you could just and it really works when you 
don't see it anymore and you're just completely sucked into viewing this world that isn't necessarily reflective of ours that's another thing that i did think about watching this and while listening to it like i i, I thought you know how much of hollywood back in the day didn't represent the real life of americans 90 years ago mm -hmm. you know for instance um so i was like i don't know i i, I get what you're saying i get what you're saying mm -hmm. i'm wondering yeah. if we've because I don't watch enough contemporary movies to make that analysis, but I'm wondering if like we're still doing that, making well, I guess we kind of are comic book movies, right? That shit's not yes. real. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I think we're living in a very similar thing because like the studio system crumbled ultimately because it was further and further away from the reality that we were living, especially in the '60s, where like everyone was talking about the things happening in the world. The president had been assassinated. The civil rights movement was going on. Uh, Vietnam was happening. And there's student protests, all this stuff, but the Hollywood films felt like they were on another planet at that time with the musicals and they just and costume dramas and these romances that just felt like they did not want to address anything happening in the real world. And so it came to a point where people just didn't want to watch those films anymore. And so that ultimately led to the downfall. And I feel like we're in the same situation now uh, where we just have these fantasies that are being constantly uh, created um, and there's nothing wrong with watching a fantasy for escapism but it can't be the only thing being produced uh, because it's, it is creating a gap between our media and our reality i could not agree with you more my friend i, I really like yeah. completely completely yeah. and where are we going for number four yeah number four is uh a pick that's very um that means a lot to me it's uh his girl friday from 1940 uh, it's a screwball comedy, and that was one of the genres that epitomizes classic Hollywood style, the fast-talking, uh, romantic comedies that they created during this time. And uh, you could see a lot of the influence of these types of films, you know, trickle all the way down to, to modern romantic comedies with, uh, you know, plots that, you know, some characters are contriving to uh, to uh, trap their romantic partners or stop them from doing, um, stop them from getting married or whatever. Um and so, but the in the in the thirties and forties, um, this was a huge trope of of the this, this studio system where they made these really um, almost whimsical and witty romance uh, romantic films. And His Girl Friday is, you know, arguably the best of them. It's set in the newspaper world again, like our last pick, but it's uh, completely opposite of the last movie where it starts Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell. And Grant is the guy who runs a newspaper and uh, his ex um, was the star reporter there. Now she's moving on with her, her fiance and she's in town to tell him that she's leaving and Cary Grant is doing everything he can to prevent her from leaving, uh, break up her, her relationship and get her back on the paper. And so um, as he keeps setting all these traps for her and, and kind of luring her back in uh, because the guy she's, she's uh, leaving town with, he's kind of a, kind of a dope. Um, but, um, as you know, he's trying to, to lure her back in, there is a, a very serious plot of a guy, of an innocent guy who's going to be hanged and the newspapers are kind of running wild with the stories of this guy and kind of, uh, dragging him and his lover through the mud. And so as the, the trappings that Cary Grant has set for, for Russell's character, uh, start to set in, she becomes more and more interested in, in actually reporting on the truth of this case. And so, uh, while it does, you know, explore these, um, you know, negatives of the of the newspaper world. It's a very whimsical, fast paced film, and so uh, it keeps it light throughout the entire picture. And it's just uh, it's just unforgettable um, laughs, like from start to finish. And so um, I can't recommend this movie enough. Uh, on a different day, it might be number one on my list, but it's um, oh wow, really? Yeah, yeah. This is a classic through and through. This is such a great picture. I I can't say I've sat down and watched this through and through, but I know I've seen pieces of it uh, for sure. Cary Grant is just like such a famous star from back in the day, and you're right. Like also, Cary Grant's known for doing comedy, and so this film is known to me. Although, like I didn't recall the whole the the hanging plot line and th stuff like that. Um, but no, I think this is a great pick. And and but really, you would consider this as your number one on a different day. Yeah, maybe. That's so interesting to me. So interesting. <laughs> Probably well, on a per personal list, maybe. Oh, I got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, where are you going for number three? Yeah. Uh, you know, we can't talk about classic Hollywood films without talking about Alfred Hitchcock. So I wanted to spotlight one of his several masterpieces on this list with Rear Window. Um, this is one of many of the films he made while in Hollywood that changed how films were made. Um, this is a very sweaty, claustrophobic 
summer set film uh, about a photographer who's stuck at home looking out of his windows because he's nursing a broken leg. Um, and he's played by uh, James Stewart and his girlfriend's played by Grace Kelly, two of the biggest movie stars of all time. And as he's stuck at home uh, looking out the window, the only things he could see is the courtyard and the other windows uh, to the apartments across the way. And so he's sort of studying the lives of all the different people around him. And that leads him to potentially witnessing a murder. And um, he becomes increasingly obsessed with the idea of solving this murder. Uh, it kind of drags his girlfriend and his friends into this this whole plot. And uh, because it's Hitchcock, he just uses all the tools of cinema to tell the story, uh, specifically making sure the entire film is shot from, his, from the main character's point of view. So you never get to go physically as a viewer into the other apartments. And so it keeps this... Um, it, it helps build suspense that you're stuck in this apartment with this guy with a broken leg and that, um, you know, can you really believe what you hear and see in, in, in the state that you're in? And so, um, and this is just a fun movie as well. And it shows, you know, how great of a filmmaker Hitchcock was that he was able to mix uh, humor and uh, thrills all together, which is he, he did in many of his films. And so um, this is a perfect example of him you know, using Technicolor, which I think this is the first color film on the list that we were talking about. It was. Um, I noticed it yeah. when it came up in the, in the trailers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the first uh, color film, but it's in great, it's beautiful color with like this brick reds coming through and uh, Jimmy Stewart's uh, crystal blue eyes on the screen. And yeah, it's just a, this is a fantastic film. Yeah, I knew, I knew the lead right away from like playing Lou Gehrig and, and playing so many other different oh, movies, yeah. right? Um uh, but this movie, I was watching it. I was like, I don't think I've ever seen this one of his. But Ooh, then I was, yeah. I was like, but no, I was like, I have seen this. I was like, I know I've seen this. I was like, or maybe I read this, and then I was like, no, I saw something like this. And 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 then Alfred Hitchcock's name came up, and I was like, okay, I had to have seen something like this. You know, this is a famous writer director. These are stars in it. I was like, what is this? But then. I couldn't place it. And I was going to ask you if there was like a remake of this, but it, mm -hmm. it listening to you talk, it hit me. And I know where I've seen this, you know, the, the, the TV show castle. Yes. Yeah. 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 They did an episode of this where castle broke his leg and was at home mm. and he was watching <laughs> the, the person across the street mm. with binoculars and he witnesses a murder. And so like, it, it, it like I said, I just it just clicked for me that that's where it was from. Oh, so yeah. like, but I still think I might have seen this because of all the big names that are involved in the creation of this. And like, what mm -hmm. a great story of, especially of life in a city, right? Where you have huge buildings and population density is so high, the likelihood that you see some crazy shit is going to be increased because there are more people around you, right? Yeah. So like. What would it be like to witness a murder in a window across from you? What do you do? Like, are mm -hmm. you going crazy? Are you stir crazy? Like, I don't know. It's an interesting take. And like you said, like in 1954, I could definitely feel this is a different direction. And Hitchcock is known for going, you know, turning Hollywood upside down. So, like, I think this movie definitely still has some playability to it. And especially since it's still being remade because that, that castle episode wasn't too, too long ago. And I want to say there was still a movie based on this that I saw. Um, do you have any idea if there was a remake of this? Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's a, there's a uh, remake in the nineties with, I think Christopher Reeve played the Jimmy Stewart character, but also there's um, the film. Uh, I think it's called suburbia or something like that. Not, um, but it starts Shia LaBeouf as a young teen who witnesses who who he thinks maybe his neighbors killed somebody. But it's, it's more of a suburban set set version of the story. Um, but none of the you know none of the imitations of this really um, compare because this film is such great detail of all the different um, apartments, all the interior lives of all these characters are so realized um, that it really draws you in to what this guy's witnessing. And then finally, when he something happens and he thinks that he's witnessed this situation. It just, it's so startling. Um, and of course, Hitchcock is such a, a brilliant filmmaker that there are many startling moments in this film. And you, you know, you're stuck as a viewer in this wheelchair with this man with a broken leg um, in the, you know, in the fifties. So you really couldn't move, um, is, you know, compared to modern technology. And so um, it's such a, such a perfect, it's all, it's almost a perfect film. 
Yeah, this is this is I think a, a really cool film. And like I said, like if I haven't seen this, I would be willing oh, yeah. to watch this one for sure, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I think your next one is is just as well known. Actually, I think this is more well known. I think this may be one of the most well known movies on your lists for oh, sure. Yeah. So tell us about your number two. Yeah, so number two is is one of the most iconic American films ever made. It's Rebel Without a Cause from nineteen fifty five. Um, I wanted to spotlight this film because it's it's very famous for a lot of reasons. And I think it's famous to people who maybe haven't even seen it because it's got the iconic um, star James Dean in it with his red jacket. And it's very um, um, it categorizes like gang films. And, you know, you think of uh, like rockabilly music and like switchblades and, and uh, cool cars. But um, it's really a film about the you know, the myth of the American nuclear family and that everything is all right in American, uh, the American home. And, and it's, uh, it's really a film about the anxiety of these children, uh, teenagers, the youth, uh, growing up in Eisenhower's America and what's coming. Um, what are they, what world are they inheriting from their parents who seem very detached from raising kids and, um, you know, and, and this is a film that's uh, not like a lot of other Hollywood movies because it doesn't really come from a book or a play or um, it's the product of its director uh, who was reading a lot about uh, disaffected youth at the time and really wanted to make a movie about it. The director's name is Nicholas Ray, and he's one of the great auteurs to come out of Hollywood who was able to make a couple films before he was really run out of town for being um a maverick and a socialist and and uh, but he made movies that were definitely about outsider characters and this is perhaps is the ultimate outsider characters these uh teens who just don't uh or, or they can't find their way uh or their their identity in uh american society and so um this is a precursor to so much like of the new hollywood films like easy rider and um you know, dennis hopper is even in this movie he's one of the the supporting characters in this film and uh it has so much influence on what would come um in american filmmaking that um it's such a different kind of movie even though it's like a you know beautiful technicolor movie um yeah it's just completely different flavor from a lot of what the studios were making at the time it's kind of a miracle that it even exists uh given that it's such an indictment of of a uh, nuclear family in america but it's uh, one of the all-time greats and I'll tell you, so talking about stuff that have lived on or films that have lived on in the pop culture today that's done a zeitgeist, you know, we we talked about um, Scarface already. So, like, if I were going to say, like, what are three older movies that you would probably still or you do still see at, like, university poster shops mm -hmm. um, or poster sales, Scarface, you definitely see a poster of that. Marilyn Monroe, definitely mm -hmm. see a poster of that. Yeah. And James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause, definitely see a poster of that, yeah. without a doubt, without a mm -hmm. doubt. Like, this is, James Dean is is majorly famous, but this is his most famous film, without a doubt. Sure. And that being said, I've never seen a single one of his movies, <laughs> <laughs> including this one. Never yeah. saw it. And I think I think maybe it's just because it represents, or to me, by the time, like, I came of age to know it, I felt like, oh, this is some guy just trying to be cool guy USA. And I was like, punk rock, fuck him. You know, like, like it just, and so I never got yeah. into it. Um, yeah. I was always just part of the counterculture that was like, screw that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even though like it represented counterculture itself. Mm -hmm. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, at that time though, I didn't realize that. So I've never seen this one. So like the trailer was the first I've ever seen of any footage of it, right? Oh, and wow. so I was really surprised with how it how you explained you know it was about a youth who was different who was dejected and rejected mm -hmm. and just like a family that didn't work right and you know like, what was his comment he told his grandma if she lied anymore she turned to stone or something like that i was like <laughs> i was just like it, it it seemed like it worked but it didn't work and it kind of seemed like that was the point mm -hmm. like the the point of this all is supposed to show that things aren't working as you think they they do work yeah and in comparison to a lot of the other hollywood films that we've been talking about how hollywood shows a picture that isn't based on reality would you say that this one is more of a turning point where hollywood starts to look at things that are happening 
Absolutely. I mean, I think in one regards, it's making a film about what's happening in real life to some of these two young people. I mean, there's even a, a supporting character in this film um, who's gay, but the film can't come out and, and outright say he's gay. But it's got all these, uh, it's about all these teens who don't really know what they're doing um, and don't want the lives their parents have. But at the same time, it's made with such a panache of style and studio um, power that it has the classic look to to Hollywood film. So I think this is like uh, what we were talking about earlier uh, with the Hayes Code. This is a way filmmakers in Hollywood were able to talk about things uh, without, you know, indirectly, without having to um, deal with the backlash from the censorship. So, um, but yeah, this is, uh, this is the kind of film that definitely opened the doors for a lot of filmmakers later on to use as inspiration when they didn't have to abide by the Hayes Code. That's incredible to me. And it's incredible to think about this movie yeah. came out just yeah. 10 years after World War II ended. Like this came yeah. out in 1955. Mm -hmm. You know, the Korean War had just ended and we lost, you know, PS, mm -hmm. like that did not turn out <laughs> yeah. well. Um, and, and so like this movie comes out and just, mm -hmm. you know, I may have to take a look at this film. I may yeah, have to, yeah. you know, I, uh, I don't think I'm going to buy a poster, but I may look at the film. <laughs> Yeah, a little aside, because uh, like I said, Dennis Hopper is one of the uh, supporting actors in this film, very young in his career. Uh, there's a great three films you could put together that Dennis Hopper is in. So you have this one, which is about counterculture of the 50s, and then he's the writer, director, star of Easy Rider the, in, in 69, um, and talking about counterculture then. And then he wrote and directed a film called Out of the Blue, which I think we talked about or, when we talked about punk movies, uh, where he plays the father and that's about the counterculture during the Reagan administration or the Reagan era. And so like these three films, I think, work really well as a trilogy of counterculture films in America, um, starting with this one. Wow, we may have to set some uh, some kind of <laughs> summer movie series up next yeah. summer and, and do a watch along. That'd be cool. Yeah. All right, my friend, take us to your number one, the number one Hollywood summer movie classic. What you got? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, I think, no movie that better represents Hollywood at its best than Casablanca from 1942. I mean, this is a film that just has everything um, indicative of Hollywood in it. And so it's uh, it's an espionage thriller set in Morocco in a bar owned by an American expatriate named Rick, who is... Uh, just wants to be left alone and run his bar, but the Nazis are there taking over everything um and the local police are cracking down everybody to make sure everything is in line uh because the nazis are there and uh rick is just trying to keep his shit together and stay out of stay out of all of it um and the nazis are searching for the spy and the spy shows up and his wife is rick's ex who he's, he's still carrying a torch for and so rick is put in a position if he should help them escape or if you should do nothing and let the Nazis uh, potentially kill both of them. And so it's this great sort of uh, bottle movie of everyone stuck in this bar the Nazis, the European forces, the local cops, Rick, everybody. And it's just incredibly romantic because, you know, it brings up a lot of, uh, a lot of feelings now that she's back and it starts Humphrey Bogart as the main character and Ingrid Bergman, who is one of the most beautiful movie stars of all time as his ex and so um it's got uh the song you must remember this which is sung in the film which is still iconic to this day um and yeah it's just a great uh film all around you know it, it manages to uh balance its humor with its romanticism with its cynicism with its uh patriot you know patriotism um and it's thrills uh all together and, and peter laurie is in this film which i didn't even uh bring up he was one of the great uh, actors to migrate from from Germany, and um, and Conrad Veit, who I'm going off on a huge tangent here, but he's the Nazi villain who was who goes all the way back to silent cinema, and he's in a ton of uh, really famous silent films. But he in America in the 40s is now playing a Nazi bad guy, and so uh, it's just a great uh, snapshot of everything that represents the best that Hollywood could do uh, is in this film. This this film is the one on the list that I've seen through and through and seen multiple times. Nice. And in fact, I've seen this one like at least once every decade of my life. 
No. Like every so often mm-hmm. I like rewatch this to see one, does it hold up? Two, does my experience in my life as I've changed change the way I view this film? And mm-hmm. every time I watch it, I pick up so much more. There are mm-hmm. so many layers to this film. And like you said, so it's in it's in Morocco and the Nazis are are coming, but this is before the US enters the war. So like this is a precursor, like Humphrey Bogart's character represents the United States. Does he get involved in all this bullshit or does he just try to make his money? And and that's the exact metaphor that the U.S. was considering. Like, do we get involved in World War II or do we just stay here and make money? Mm -hmm. And this movie like paints that picture so beautifully and and words you want to talk about catchphrases this was the film i was talking about all along oh yeah like right. there are so many phrases like you said the the song is iconic mm-hmm. but you know like here's looking at you kid or mm-hmm. this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship there's yeah, yeah. so so many more too that i'm just i'm not going to go off on a tangent about but like <laughs> this, this is great. one of yeah, great script. Yeah, this is one of the most quotable movies and the most quoted movies probably of all time. Mm-hmm. Like, it's still mm-hmm. around. And I, I think that's pretty incredible. It really is. Uh, was it 81 years later, you know? Like, mm-hmm. this is... I don't know, but I, I think you said it better. That, like, this is number one. Yeah, good choice, yeah. good choice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it, it kind of like... Talk about what's happening in the world at the time this movie is made. Like I, I, I mentioned Peter Lorre and Conrad Viet who were in the film, but also uh, Michael Curtis, who directed this film, and many other filmmakers like Billy Wilder or um, Douglas Sirk. Like all these guys came from Europe and came to America. And really the ingenuity of all the German filmmakers and the European filmmakers, like Hitchcock was from England, but he wasn't going back now because the Germans were bombing uh, London. Um all these people came to America and they changed the movie system. They made all these great films. They used the engine, you know, the ingenuity these guys uh, had brought from European filmmaking. And this is a testament to that. Because Mike Curtis is a fantastic filmmaker. Name the bar. Uh, the bar that it's called Rick's, isn't it? Ah, oh, I think you're right. Yeah, I thought yeah. it was something else, but yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Guess what is the town they're in? Right, um, right. And then I think it's just called Ricks. Yeah, because why did why why call it anything else? You know, just make yeah. it about yourself, <laughs> <laughs> which is so American yeah. too, right? You know, yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Maybe great list, my friend. Great yeah. list. And you know, normally I start off why why do you pick this list but you know what i think it makes more sense to just kick that one to the end with our other questions <laughs> sure. um let's start off with do you have any runners up or or a runner up you know a film that you didn't quite put on the list but almost made it yeah there's quite a few uh but trying not to be redundant but one thing that uh you know a figure that's hard to talk about uh this period without mentioning is orson wells and so we could talk about Citizen Kane, but you know enough has been said about that movie. So we can wow. move on. Uh, however, I did want to talk about a film that he is in that's uh, of this time that's sort of a American, um, European, British um, cross production. It's called The Third Man, um, and it's a film made in Vienna right after the war. And so all of the rubble and the destruction is all present on the screen. And I mean, it's a film about a guy who travels to Vienna to find his friend who uh, who may be dead. And so while he's trying to investigate the death of his friend, find out what happened, uh, there's a mysterious third man who witnessed the death of his friend who's trying to find out who is the third man. Um, but you're seeing through this great noir espionage film how the allies are carving up Europe at this time. And so he's having to kind of juggle between all the different forces of this town and try to solve this mystery. Um, and it's a great thriller with a script that just feels so modern. Like it's, if you watch films from this period, I mean, I think this movie came out in 1940. Um, Graham Greene, the, the, the novelist wrote this and it just feels super fresh and, and, and like the way people talk today, um, like how fast and, and just engaging it is, but it's a, it's a great thriller. That's not only, explores the isolation and the, and the and the the despair that a lot of people who live in this area are feeling but it's also 
a film about the you know the wolves of war profiteering are circling in on this on this area and so um it just checks off a lot of great boxes to be a, a you know an entertaining film but also a representation of what's happening in the world at the time when it came out ah i like the sound of it i like it. especially i like the sound of filming right after the war ends so all the rubble is still there and so it mm -hmm. makes it even more real that you're searching for your friend and you don't know if they made it or not yeah. and you're just you're going through the travesty of war i think that would be incredible to watch it was such yeah. a great choice great choice yeah. Thank you. well i mean on to that you know like films from back in the day i really thought about this list and you know do you think older movies are better than newer movies like you view so you I think without asking, because I'm not going to ask you, but I, I kind of know your opinion on how you feel about genre and exploitation films in the 80s and the 70s. You talk about a lot of great films from those. You talk about films from back in the day. This list is all about back in the day. Do you think older movies are better than newer movies? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> now, tell me why. Tell me yes. why, my friend. Yeah. Um, I think there's a um, a loss of creativity and ingenuity in our in our movies today like our movies today it's and it's always been an inherent problem with with american movies especially is that once you find something that makes money you do it to death until you kill it um however there, there was a diversity of ideas during this time and later periods uh in movies um and now the only thing that's out there is one or two ideas and they're dominating they're taking up every screen um and we have fewer and fewer films for adults we have fewer and fewer films um that have small budgets we have fewer and fewer films that allow the people who make them to be artistic you know to express themselves artistically whether it's writing or directing or acting um and it seems you know to me that the issue is and we're seeing this because everyone is uh, everyone who's got creative um or the, you know, the most creative individuals who who propel films are on strike right now in Hollywood is that the corporatization of stu the studios, uh, they don't care about the product as much as the older guys did um, who ran the studios who cared about making um, a product that, uh, you know, that had quality to it. Now it's just, it's just going to make money and how long it will make money for before we turn over the next version of that to make money on it all over again. Um, and they don't have a lot of value in what they create and who they're employing to create it and so um that's to me illustrates why older films are better than newer films i dig it i dig it and i dig the fact that you you brought up the strike yeah the writers guild and the screen actors of america guild are are both on strike mm -hmm. now yeah. and and they're like dude no no enough enough yeah. and uh yeah. Yes. Good. but i'm not the studio I'm not, system yeah, right now yes. like yeah yes yes but i'm not saying that uh you know, that's why I think movies, there's a difference between movies now and then, but also, you know, the, the studio system the during the time period we just discussed was not, you know, great in, in many regards. I mean, it produced some really great films, but, you know, they, they uh, ruined people's lives. They um, sure, blacklisted it was still people. Like, <laughs> they did a lot of awful yeah. things. Yes. So I, don't, I just want to make sure that I uh, covered that. So it doesn't seem like it was perfect, but uh, within all that, they were still, everyone who still worked in this industry still valued the product that they were making. The um, And I think in another regards, at least in my own personal taste, um, CGI really takes me out of a film when you, when like to me, filmmaking is um, the performance, the ingenuity of people on screen. So whether it's stunt work or it's acting or it's creating sets um, or the, you know, the sort of, um, magician like quality to special effects all that is taken out when you can do it in coding uh, or the click of a mouse and it creates um, you know less of a spectacle where it doesn't you know feel you don't feel like you're like watching you know extreme great talents on the screen pull something off that's stunning right, to an audience right. and so i think to, to to a degree that also makes films modern films you know less desirable to me Oh, I feel that. I feel that. Um, the Uncanny Valley with, you know, AI and artificially creating characters and then splitting it with the animation. Like, we're at a weird place in, in movie making. And so mm -hmm. I think there is some value to older films. However, you know, this brings me to my next question. I think we've touched on this before, but 
uh, not in a while. And, it's, and so I'm going to ask mm. you for myself, and I know I'm speaking for a lot of people here, black and white films are inaccessible. Like if I see a film is in black and white, I'm more than likely just disinterested already. I'm like, I'm not going to watch it. It's some old shit. Like, and I, and I know that's a completely horrible bias opinion to have, but it's just how I feel. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't care to watch something in black and white whenever I can watch stuff in full color and be more visually mm -hmm. stimulated. So to me and to the many people who are out there who are like that, how do you bring us into the fold of saying, look, check these movies out, even though they're black and white? How, what do you say to me? Yeah, so I guess uh, before I answer that, what what about black and white is a turnoff? I think it's just like the lack of color, really, like the visual mm -hmm. stimulations. I I live in color. I love color. I love bright, mm -hmm. vibrant colors. I like, you know, I, I just don't like, I don't know. I just like color. And black and white to me seems boring. Mm -hmm. it, it just yeah. seems like mm -hmm. um, monotone like and just not stimulating. Yeah. yeah. But okay. I don't know if there's anything else than that. Sure. Um so I'll, I'll explain it the best way I can to what attracts me to a black and white film. Um, and I don't think that the same thing to me, they both exist color and black and white and they don't not, one is not better than the other. Depends on how you use whether you're shooting in color or whether you were making a film black and white, which black and white was a standard for a long time before color film was invented. But uh, so there was no, you know, there was no um, alternatives. Um but for me, when I go back and I watch an older film that's in black and white, it's it transports me to another place in time and a different reality, a different way things look and feel. Um, now, there are plenty of bad black and white films. But when you watch a good black and white film um, that knows how to shoot, the, the lighting is made for black and white. You get a different way, um, different cinematic language. And it really feels like you're being transported to another place. Uh, whether that place is, you know, you're watching a film from Germany in the 1920s and the fashion so different, the way people look are so different, the way um, technology looks is so different. It's it's a view of the future, it's a view of the past, excuse me, but also it it feels so alien that it's almost like a complete fantasy um, to me when you're watching something that just seems so far removed from how the world is today. Um, and to me, that's that's so compelling to see to be able to see these um, these snapshots of the world or these creations that were made in a, in a way that we don't see the world because we see the world in color. Um, so it's completely new to me, and it feels different to me than watching a film that could be in color. Um, and especially the way film grading today, uh, a lot of the colors are flat and they don't pop and they're not used for any storytelling purposes. Um, and they're very humdrum in the way that they're just in color because that's we have the technology to do it. They're not using color in any any um, specific way. Black and white films really kind of come through and, and it really illustrate the world that they're they're showing uh, or presenting on the screen. So that may not be the case for everybody, but I do think that <laughs> um, once you get into a film that is in black and white and you're realizing like the strengths of the medium in that regards uh, can be very engaging. I will say yeah, I agree with you. Like when I watch Casablanca, I don't care that it's in black and white. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe it's because it does such a wonderful job of transporting me back into that time period and to a different world and to somewhere that mm -hmm. is just completely foreign to me. And I'm like, what is this place? What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's drawing. Uh, it draws me to it. So I, could, yeah. I dig that. I could get behind that. I mean, a good example is like if uh, any film is good enough, you weren't, you're not going to care about it, right? Well, if it's in black and white, the color, like you just said. But uh, think about the Kurosawa films, like those great films in black and white. Yeah. Like, uh, are you Seven familiar? Samurai, with, yeah. Hidden familiar Fortress. with uh, Throne of Blood, um, the uh, um, Macbeth adaptation that he did. Um, you know, there's the whole thing about like, uh, you know, Japanese women of I mean, feudal Japan would would put that black dye in their mouth, and so like the uh, Lady Macbeth character in that film, she's when she's freaking out towards the end of the story, where she's like, you know, the blood won't come off her hands. Like you can see that inky blackness in her mouth, I and mean, that black and white just really, um, just it makes it look so deep and and disgusting and vile um, that it really illustrates her character more than maybe a color could have done. 
That's interesting to me. It is interesting to me. And and for sure, I like your statement that it's like, well, you know, there are not all good movies are, are in not all black and white movies are good movies. Not all color sure. movies are good yes. movies. Yes. You know? <laughs> like like really. So so yeah. a good movie is a good movie regardless of the the color format. Yes. Um, I will say I do enjoy Technicolor a lot. And it oh, is yes, they, it seems like those colors are a lot more vibrant than what things are today. And I will say like when I watch Bollywood picks, I see color used a whole lot more vibrantly than it is used in American cinema. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think perhaps maybe like, yeah, 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 no, more <laughs> black and white movies. All right, I got you, I got yeah, you. Yeah. All right, let's 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 wrap this up with the two questions we always end on, my friend. So, so kind of mixed into one: why is this list important to you? You know, why'd you choose it? But then, like, why should other people think this list is important as well? Take it away. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this uh, this is important to me because I, uh, you know, I do say a lot of bad things about American movies on this podcast because they don't, <laughs> it, as a whole, they don't always hold my interest as much as many other films around the world. I mean, my that's where my interests lie. But there are a great number of films that were produced in Hollywood, um, given all the all of the you know censorship and and um, uh, you know the way that we don't uh, maybe necessarily engage in art in a large company uh, which is how studios are or what they are they're not independent productions and they're not so engrossed in art but uh, they did these these studios they did churn out some of the most defining pictures uh, of the medium and the history of the medium and so um, there's a lot of great value to them and I you know and I love all the movies of a certain time period. I mean, they, they speak to me uh, in ways that films that can't, that didn't have to do with censorship did because they found ways to do things um, metaphorically that are sometimes more satisfying with uh, in storytelling than the abil your ability to just come out and say the thing or show the thing that you want to talk about. Um, and that's always been fascinating to me. Um, but yeah, why it's important to other people to enjoy this list, I think it's because of the, the state of our own cinema is in, uh, you know, it's pretty piss poor right now. And I don't know if we're going to be getting a lot of new movies, uh, you know, in the next year, uh, because of the, the the way that our studio systems are being run right now. Um, Hell yeah, a perfect time <laughs> during the strike to yes. check out old movies. <laughs> Yes, but uh, you know the the if you look at our films now, um, they just lack a lot of character, and, they, and while they have some good, you know, you know one one or two really good ones will come out every year, and um, around the war season, or even our blockbusters are, are lackluster. And where you go back and you look at, you know, our film culture used to be really about spectacle and uh, engaging in the audience, and so um, looking at our older films really. You know, shows that we could do this. We could do it again if we, if the people who made movies cared enough to make those kinds of films and not butcher them to hell and trying to make us, <laughs> you know, the maximum amount of money off of them by making every movie accessible to every person walking in the door. Um, you know, and with that comes diversifying. Not only, you know, the way that we talk about uh, diversity and representation on screen, but like diversifying the kinds of films we make opens the door to more possibilities and ingenuity and and you know it spreads it around for everybody but now it just seems to be um shrinking and so i hope if uh if you're interested in movies and american movies and you're you don't really find that new movies really speak to you or that they're not very engaging go back and check out the classics because um, there's a lot of great ones out there i i think that's incredibly important and true because there are so many older films out there because studio systems pumped them out pretty quickly. And this is a shorthand to say, hey, look, check out one of these 10 first. Like, yeah. it, and it makes it more accessible. And even for me, who, who hasn't seen most of this list, I would check out all of these movies. Um, and I would definitely rewatch Casablanca again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Although I think and I have I, to wait another five years. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, one, of the, one of the last things I will say is I love showing older movies to younger people because... I think there is this idea that, uh, you know, older movies are stodgy and they don't have a lot to say about, um, not relevant anymore. They don't have a lot to, they don't speak to a lot of what's happening in the world or in our lives. But I'm always surprised when I show someone a, a, an older film and they see something and they're like, wow, this is still, you know, this is still really, really important to what's happening today. Or I didn't realize movies from 80 years ago were talking about, you know, 
subjects that we're still struggling with and rights that we're still struggling with in this country and um the representation was on screen in these times before they were you know um washed you know whitewashed out by the censors and things like that and so there's a lot of great history to be found in here that shows like what could have happened had you know history not um pushed a lot of things to the side and um i think you'd be surprised at the things you find out there in these movies i couldn't agree more i could not agree more so check them out, people. You got time this summer, and as the strike goes on, and going to be anything new coming out anyway, so you just as soon <laughs> check out these Hollywood summer classics. And Gregory Day, as always, thank you so much for coming on. But before you take off, why don't you make sure you tell the good people where they can find you and, and what you've been working on lately. Yeah, right now, uh, I am working on something I can't really talk about on the show, Ooh, but I will juicy, hopefully juicy. very soon. Uh, but right now, you can find me on Instagram at uh, hipsvillead and on Substack at badday.substack.com. I love it. Check them out, people, and definitely let us know when you can talk about that thing that you can't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Hipsville AD's top 10 list. Check out our friend Gregory Day online. Follow him everywhere, people. And always remember that Lo-Fi Poli Sci is more than just me. It's the we that we be. Talk to you soon, Lo-Fi listeners. Pickering and Day, signing off. Good night, folks.